Well, good evening, everybody, and um, thank you very much for joining uh, this Four Farmers uh, webinar, which we've called uh, What About Soy? or all the things that you wanted to ask about soy uh, and soya, but never had uh, the chance uh, to do it. So my name is Nick Major. I'm the Corporate Affairs Director for Four Farmers, uh, and I lead on sustainability uh, within the group. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Sarah Bond, who's uh, one of our raw material managers, and she has responsibility uh, for, for buying all of our proteins uh, and uh, soya uh, in particular. So our agenda for this for this evening, what we want to try and run through over the next um, uh, hour, but including some time for questions, of course. So, so we'll run through uh, these uh, topics. So we'll set the scene, talk a little bit about the future, um, how we source uh, responsibly, what our ambitions are uh, regarding responsible sourcing, and also take a look at the potential alternatives uh, to soy uh, that are coming down uh, the pipeline. Uh, and I mentioned um, time for questions uh, at the end, uh, so please ask away, ask as many questions uh, as you wish. Uh, we'll try to answer them, uh, many of them join the webinar and if we either run out of time or we need somebody somebody else to help us uh, with the answer to the question then we'll we'll, we'll come back to you and you can do that uh, by using the blue arrow on the top uh, right hand corner uh, of your screen so let me just um set the scene and i, I guess i don't need to tell you uh, and perhaps it's why you've uh, joined us uh, for this webinar it's certainly why we've arranged it because yeah, the focus uh, is very much on soya. All eyes are on soya. So, you know, regularly in the press, we see these sorts of uh, of headlines, uh, uh, and uh, that is um, uh, added to, as it were, by civil society, by NGOs. So we have this sort of uh, almost sort of constant challenge uh, to the role uh, of soya. Uh, and I think, you know, when you look at some of these headlines that, that we've put up here, I mean, they ask some 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 good questions and uh, some of which we'll try to answer uh, during the course of this uh, of this webinar. So I think they're, they're, they're legitimate, legitimate questions and we'll try to uh, we'll try to answer them. And, and of course, once you get um, civil society uh, challenging uh, and asking about uh, uh, subjects such as uh, deforestation, of course, then government steps in uh, and, and looks to act. Uh, and both in the EU, but more relevant for today's webinar here in the UK, um, you'll be aware um, that there are proposals uh, that will require companies over a certain size uh, to demonstrate effective due diligence on their forest risk uh, commodities. And this is, current, this is currently part of the Environment Bill uh, that's going through Parliament as we speak. And although obviously we're fo focusing today on on soya, obviously you know tropical uh, uh, tropical for deforestation risks are not linked to um, soya. I mean they include other things like palm oil and cocoa and coffee and timber. But as we'll explain in a moment, you know soya meal is really a you know a, a sort of a feed uh, industry issue. J just to explain as well, uh, as far as this legislation is concerned. The due diligence and the requirements uh, are to show that you are not using uh, forest risk commodities that have been produced illegally. Uh, and I'll explain the difference, obviously, between uh, and how the definitions are changing between illegal deforestation and deforestation free um, in a moment or two. So if there's all this challenge and all this sort of criticism of, uh, of soya and soya bean meal, then why do we uh, why do we? Uh, carry on using it uh, and the reason is it's a seriously good uh, feed material uh, and Sarah will explain more about the overall value um, from from soya beans uh, and the way that it breaks down into the oil and, and the meal but you know it's grown very effectively in subtropical uh, areas uh, you know there's a good reason why uh, why soya beans are grown in uh, South America and, and, and North America and in Brazil, for example, uh, you know there are three harvests uh, in one uh, in one season. And for us as nutritionists, what soya bean meal provides is is an excellent source of digestible uh, amino acids. And they provide us with those limiting uh, amino acids that we need to optimize our diets. Uh, 
uh, and they and soya bean meal compensates uh, for the low levels of these limiting amino acids uh, in cereals. So it's a good feed material. Uh, it's an efficient one from our point of view, and it has a very good amino acid um, profile. So that's the sort of setting the scene. And, and so if you like, if there are all those challenges, then you know why don't we just source our soya bean uh, our soybean meal locally? Uh, and so Sarah, I'll hand the floor over to you to explain where it comes from and, and where we import our soya from. Okay, thanks, Nick, and evening, everybody. So we've heard from Nick how soya has been grabbing the headlines over the last few years. I'm just going to give you a little bit more background and explain why we can't source it closer to home. So we move on to the next one. Yep. So where does soya grow? So we've got 364 million tonnes of soya beans will be grown in the world this year. Um, and that's really to satisfy the world's ever increasing demands. It's moved up from a hundred, well, it's moved up by a hundred million tons um, over the last sort of eight to ten, 10 years and will continue to rise. So whilst we've grown trial quantities in the UK okay, and we've sort of played around with it and we grow about two and a half million tons of beans in Europe, really to make it commercially viable, the crops do need subtropical conditions and plenty of sunlight, which unfortunately we don't get enough in Europe. Brazil took over from the US as the largest producer in 2017, and that will produce 137 million tonnes this year, and I think set to produce more like 145 million tonnes next year. So there's year on year growth in Brazil. Harvest in South America is February to May time. Harvest in North America, um, so Canada and the US, is September, October time. So what that does is allow us all year round access to a competitive supply of beans. Just to add as a bit of an aside, because we always like to talk about China when we're talking about soya beans, China only produces about 20 million tonnes of its own beans due to its climate, but it also does import 100 million tonnes of beans. Now that's massive and they have a massive impact on the pricing on a daily basis, but they could also have a real impact on the sustainable production if they wanted to as the world's largest buyer. So if we just look to the right hand side then in terms of the UK, we buy all our soya in the UK. We call it any origin soya. So it's bought to a specific quality sort of protein and oil level. Um, but from a commercial point of view, what we do is we leave our suppliers to buy, depending on the time of year, from the most cost, cost effective source that they can. If you look back to 2020, because what we do with our suppliers is although they can buy from any origin, we do specify that they tell us what origin they've um, delivered it from after the event. So then what we can do is we can track on a mill by mill on an on a overall UK basis where all the soyas come from. So you can see there from 2020, 43% of our soya um, came from the US, 14% from Brazil, 43% from Argentina. The UK as a whole feed industry imports less than 1% of the world's 364 million tonne production and Europe less than 8%. Uh, so there are other players out there that are more influential than us. Okay, so what are we actually sourcing? I think if we move on to the next slide, uh, we've got a picture of a soya bean. Uh, this bean is crushed in large plant plants, either in the US, Argentina, um, etc., or in Europe. The oil is then extracted and used in biodiesel, in foods or for frying. But actually, the meal is the primary product for the crusher, and 80% of the bean is meal. Of this 80%, 97% is used in animal feed, and actually, only 3% in food products like protein alternatives, uh, soya milk, etc. So, really, just to highlight that we all need to be aware that soy production around the world is driven by our demands in the feed industry. But turning that on its head and looking at it positively, what this does is really influence us um, in the production of soya and pushes it to produce it in a more sustainable way. Just to sort of give you a little bit of background on the uh, supply chain on the next slide, um, we've got large farms out in um, North and South America and they're supplying numerous elevators and silos just really as a collection point for the beans um, from the various areas locally. From these elevators and silos, uh, the beans are then moved on into the crush plant or the processor. The crush plant then squeezes and extracts the oil to produce the meal. 
And then the meal and the beans then either enter the local markets within the country, because obviously they utilize a lot themselves, or the international markets where they're moved in shipments, anything from sort of 30,000 tonne shiploads up to 55,000 tonnes um, in one shipment. And that could be coming from multiple crush crushers. Uh, those ships then either go direct into Rotterdam or into the large ports in the UK like uh, Portland, Liverpool, uh, Portbury, etc. Um, the meal that goes into Rotterdam in the large shipments then can also be transshipped back to the UK and about 15 million tonnes um, of imports of beans go into Europe and they're further crushed in Europe and then that meal can come back out into the UK around the various ports. So just to summarise, it's a complex chain. Um, it makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to physically track the beans from the farm source through to our feed mill and ultimately to your feed. Okay, and that I'll pass back to you, Nick. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so let's uh, let me sp spend a, a few minutes talking about uh, deforestation, how it's de how it's defined. Um, uh, and the sort of changing focus and emphasis, I suppose, uh, on deforestation. And I think probably yeah, it's worth saying that we're we're focusing here for the next few slides on on deforestation because that is the main uh, concern, I suppose, expressed by civil society and policymakers when it comes to um, the sustainability, the responsible sourcing of soya bean. But as Sarah will explain later on, when we refer to responsible or sustainable sourcing of soya bean, we're actually referring to yeah, to a, a whole wide, a whole a much wider range of criteria. But let's just focus in on a minute on uh, deforestation. And obviously, you know, these are the sort of the photos, um, you know, uh, that, that when you see it either in a photo or in re real life, as it were, sort of do just stop you uh, and and uh, you know, make you make you think. Uh, and I just wanted to focus on the on the Amazon. Uh, and I suppose if there are one or two key points uh, that I'd you know I'd suggest you, you that we'd like you to take away with you during this webinar this is absolutely um, one of them so um, you know on a fairly regular basis you know there are there are media there's media coverage uh, of the sort of uh, Amazon uh, fires and somehow either deliberately or sort of accidentally that gets linked um, to soya and the soya used in uh, animal feed. So the link is made, if you like, between the Amazon fires in the Amazon uh, and the uh, li animal feed industry, and therefore the, uh, the 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 livestock industry. And that link just does not exist. There is absolutely no link between soya that's used in Europe, soya that's used in the animal feed industry uh, that you're using as our customers, uh, and deforestation uh, in the Amazon. And the reason for that is shown on the slide. Because in 2008, uh, the Amazon soy moratorium was brokered, and it was broken be brokered between uh, the NGOs uh, and the traders uh, and the users like ourselves uh, he here in Europe. And so that moratorium uh, means that no soya is traded or financed in areas that were deforestate deforested in the Amazon biome after 2008. So you've got this deforestation cutoff date of 2008. So I can't promise you that that um, uh, you know that campaigners won't still to try to uh, to to make the link. But what I can uh, promise you is there is no actual uh, link between the Amazon fires uh, and deforestation in the Amazon and the an animal uh, feed industry and livestock production. So to some extent, and you know, and that's a success story, right? I mean, that has basically you know slowed down, uh, obviously slowed down. The uh, the deforestation in the Amazon, which is which no one's going to you know argue with at all. So, whilst as it were until now, perhaps you know the focus has been on tropical deforestation, uh, and we've already referred to, and others will refer to you know deforestation, illegal deforestation, and uh, deforestation free. But actually, there are other areas uh, where soya is grown, which are also sensitive which aren't um, covered in tropical forest uh, and this is a photograph of the Cerrado. The Cerrado is a, is a huge area uh, in Brazil um, and uh, it's used uh, to grow uh, soya but there's no tropical forest uh, but it's still high value uh, native 
um, vegetation. So as you'll see there, you know, there's natural forest, there's forest, it's not tropical forest, but there's native grasslands, there's swamps, there's peatlands, there's savannas, etc. And if you like, those are also high value ecosystems which we want to try and protect. So if you move beyond deforestation free, we now start to talk more and more about deforestation and conversion free so that we're protecting all of those high value uh, you know, habitats as it were ecosystems whether it's tropical forest or whether these the sort of high value you know savannas so um, you know when we talk uh, increasingly about deforestation conversion free it means that no soil has been produced uh, on land uh, that has been cleared in those areas after a certain uh, cutoff date so from from deforestation to deforestation and uh, conversion free. So let's now move on a little bit to um, okay. So that's uh, yeah, that's the, the the context. So yeah, how do we as four farmers ensure that the soya bean meal that we're using is sourced uh, responsibly? And before I sort of hand over to Sarah to talk about the specifics, let me just sort of put this into context within our own uh, sustainability. Uh, strategy, which we we call going circular. We effectively, we take uh, a circular approach uh, to, sustain, to sustainability. And the reason that we do that is because a circular approach really plays to the strength of the role and recognizes the role of livestock in sustainable uh, food systems, you know, by the, the fact that, that livestock are converting, you know, low value materials into high quality uh, protein that, that we as humans can uh, can consume and as you can see from the, the graphic there we effectively uh, 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 have th break our, 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 our strategy into three themes so the first of all I'm going to go the, the first is feed resources on the top left there feed resources means our raw materials obviously which is what we're focusing on this evening so we want to source responsibly and we want to maximize the use of non-food materials and I'll say a little bit more about that for a moment but just to put this into context and and when we talk about environmental footprint when we look at the environmental footprint of one ton of compound feed delivered to your farm then nearly 95 percent of the carbon footprint is in the raw materials that we use uh, the growing the cultivation the storage the process at uh, the processing you know the crop protection uh, that's used to grow those feed materials contribute 95 percent of our overall carbon footprint and if I move over to feed production if you like which is what we do you know we, we manufacture and we deliver to you that is five percent of the overall footprint it doesn't mean to say that we don't focus on that and as you'll see in a moment absolutely we do but just to sort of put that into the context and then of course the feed solutions you know the the the, the advice and the services and the products that we provide uh, uh, to you to ensure that there's a balanced use of resources in the in the total uh, animal chain, in the, in the whole um, supply chain. So that is also an, a very important part uh, of what we do. So that's our, how, we, um, how we structure our sustainability approach. You'll see around the outside, there are some boundaries, environment, animal health and welfare, and people and society. And, and that's because we will work within those societal boundaries. So, so we don't we don't choose, our sustainability strategy does not force us to choose between large or small, organic or conventional, indoor or outdoor. You know, those are all uh, production systems that we will be using. And, and our job uh, as nutritionists is to help our customers to improve their sustainability performance uh, in, which, in, 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 in whichever production system uh, they are using. And we need to make this, you know, tangible. So it's it's great having a, you know, a PowerPoint slide and a, and a, and a set of PowerPoint slides that show everybody what our sustainability strategy is. But we actually need to to do to do stuff and to actually make real change happen. So to do that, we've set ourselves, uh, you know, what we think, you know, is, is a leading set of ambitions and objectives. Our ambitions are for 2030. So yeah, they're a bit on, more on the horizon and they're sort of a direction of travel. But we've set ourselves. Uh, some very clear uh, 2025 objectives and I'm going to focus on the top block in a moment but if you just focus a little, little bit on that middle block for example you know where we're on the on our own manufacturing our own operations we're working on 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 making our largest mill carbon neutral we're moving towards uh, renewable energy 
uh, and we've got a whole program uh, of initiatives to reduce our own uh, energy consumption with a with a 2030 objective of reducing our own CO2 CO2 per ton by 75 percent but if we focus in on 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 uh, of our uh, feed resources that the subject of this webinar so there's there's a block of four key 2025 objectives so the first is absolutely we want to make sure that we responsibly source uh, two of the key raw materials the one we're talking about this evening which is soybean meal and the other one that uh, we use in much lower quantities uh, but it's still one that's under some scrutiny as you'll know which is palm oil so 100% responsibly sourced palm oil and soybean and Sarah will describe in a moment or two how we define that we use a, uh, a well-recognized um, uh, code of conduct called uh, SEDEX, uh, who are a, a platform which all of our suppliers or many of our suppliers uh, feed in their, uh, their audit performance, you know, their transpar transparency uh, in terms of their own performance so that we're able to uh, exchange information with them about their own uh, performance on these type of issues. Yeah, we're looking very much to, to reduce um, our emissions, our CO2 emissions from those feed materials. Remember that 95% block of CO2 emissions that come from raw materials. They're known technically as scope three upstream uh, emissions. So we want to re reduce those. And finally, but in a way, uh, yeah, in a way, most importantly, in a way, if you if you are want to find the essence of our sustainability approach, it's this focus on non-human human edible feed materials. The Food and Agriculture Organization published a, a report a couple of years ago that showed that 86% of the feed materials that are used for livestock production are not competing with humans for food. You know, so, so we need to break this narrative, this storyline that, that, that is sometimes uh, laid against us, you know, if you like, that all the feed materials that we're feeding to livestock you know, would be better off fed to humans. I mean, that just is not uh, the case. So, that's the sort of overall, uh, a sort of broader view of our sustainability approach. Let's sort of focus in now on uh, on soya bean and how we source that responsibly. So Sarah, over to you. Okay, thank you. So I showed you earlier the complexity of the supply chain and therefore the difficulty of tracking physical soya from the farms out in North or South America into our feed mills. So we have to, we basically, as, as an um, organisation, um, as an industry, we consider soya meal sustainable when it's certified. So what we actually do is we buy certificates for set tonnages of soya, where the equivalent tonnage has been bought from soya programmes at source out in Argentina, Argentina, Brazil, US, etc. But these programmes have satisfied the criteria of the FIFAC sourcing guidelines, which is shown there on the page. FIFAC's journey in facilitating responsible soy sourcing practices for the procurement of soya started in 2006, so quite a long time ago. Its first set of guidelines were released in 2015 and it did a review um, in March, April this year. The guidelines don't just cover deforestation, which is what tends to get all the he headlines, but covers another of our, another, um, numerous other areas. Um, starting with legal compliance, um, ensuring that laws within the Pacific country are compi complied with. Um, sounds easy, but not actually as easy as it sounds in some of these countries. Um, it covers responsible working, so following health and safety rules, no child, la child labour, discrimination, etc. Um, environmental responsibility. And also good agricultural practices. Um, what we need is we need profitable production for these farms to continue. Um, we want them to maintain healthy soils, responsible use of agrochemicals, etc. Um, the guidelines follow 73 criteria required across various areas and 54 of them are essential. So the number of areas that need to be considered. The FIFAC scheme as a whole is independently benchmarked by the International Trade Centre which is actually a joint agency of the WTO and the United Nations. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, under the umbrella of the FIFAC guidelines and criteria, the major suppliers have their own standards and have to be compliant with the FIFAC guidelines. So they have their own set of rules, but very much um, linking with the FIFAC guidelines. And these are independently audited. And you can see there are probably some familiar names, the likes of Cargill, 
um, ADM, etc., cetera, um, Bungie, um, you know, big world shippers of soya. All the certificates purchased by four farmers are from schemes that meet the FIFAC guidelines and also meet the requirements of deforestation. So we've established that we buy sustainable certificates against our soya purchases, but you might be thinking, are they just bits of paper? Do they actually mean anything? What does this mean to the farmer out in Brazil or Argentina? So each certificate provides us with proof via an audit that one ton of responsible soya has been produced by a certified producer and entered the supply chain. So for every certificate, so every one ton of soya we purchase is one certificate, so it matches our tonnage. The more certificates we buy for farmers and the rest of the UK and the European feed industry, the more, more soya will be certified and obviously that will mean more will be sustainable. It is real. These two farmers, this is a picture of two farmers that, that are part of a producer group in Brazil that's been operating for a number of years. Part of, they're, they're called Catsuriso. They use the money that they get them from the certificates that we're paying on top of our price of soya. And they work with the local governments um, to educate and make this transition to sustainable agriculture. So if you look at the top left, um, they monitor the farms, the tonnages, uh, the yield, the labour, all to make them more successful and more profitable. Um, they use the money to pick up, um, to put up decent locked stores, to store agrochemicals. Um, obviously, we want a reduced risk of accidents and reducing the contamination of the environment. They provide adequate housing, decent sanitation, canteens, etc. They're all things that we take for granted here in the UK but this money is just going towards more professional farming. And then on the top right, they're starting to take health and safety very seriously um, by recording health and safety incidents, et cetera, as we would do over here. Okay, so there's different ways of driving forward this sustainable production via different supply models. And some of, this, some of these names you may have come across before and wondered what they were. So if we start, so the, the flow is really from left to right, and as you flow that way, um, the cost increases. So if we start on the left-hand side, this is the starting point. It's the cheapest option. But what it does do is drive production via the sale and purchase of certificates or credits. This could happen in any, any soy producing country and doesn't actually necessarily link with the soya beans or the meal that we're using in terms of the country, but it is encouraging sustainable production. Moving to the right hand side, we've got area mass balance certificates. These are a combination of book and claim and mass balance. The farmers are certified in a certain area and those areas are the sources where the European feed industry gets most of its soya from. So there's a link there with where the actual soya is grown. Mass balance takes it on one step further. Um, that audits a tonnage of certified soya um, right the way through the supply chain from a farm out in Argentina or Brazil or the US, right through to the end user, i.e. us, and ultimately into your feed. On at the mass balance system, the certified and the non-certified um, sources are mixed, so they're co-mingled, but it's the tonnage that is actually uh, monitored through the system. The ultimate is on the right-hand side, which is identity preserved where the actual sustainable meal that's produced or the sustainable beans that then go to become sustainable meal <coughs> produced out in source end up in your feed or into our feed meal and ultimately in our field. Um, but in terms of cost um, and in terms of practicalities, it's very difficult. So hopefully I've demonstrated that we've got a very complex supply chain. It would be very, it'd be almost impossible and very expensive if we were to push to that identity preserved route at this point in time, um, it would quickly give us the disadvantage as a UK feed industry. If, if, it was, if as an industry, we move towards more certified soya by certificates, whether it's book and claim, area mass balance, mass balance, et cetera, what it is doing for every ton we purchase a certificate, it is producing a ton of sustainable soya. So that's got to be the way forward. And as I said before, the more the industry does that, the more we'll be pushing in that direction. Thank you, Sarah, um, for explaining that. And as you say, some terminology there that I'm sure um, you know, everybody is starting to, to come across. So, so very helpful to, uh, to explain it and to define which each of the, uh, each of the steps mean. So I suppose you know, that's where we are uh, now. Um, so, so let's just think about 
the future uh, and you know what about the alternatives uh, for soya you know what are the options uh, that, that that we have and i suppose we would break them down uh, into uh, into three areas i mean first of all and i'll explain a little bit more about these um, in a moment first of all obviously there's the option to grow more protein uh, in Europe, you know, in the UK, uh, from a policy uh, point of view, you know, that's something that is very uh, attractive. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it sort of builds in the sort of feed and food security uh, issue because we're very reliant uh, on imports, as, as we've been, as we've seen earlier on, for our high protein uh, 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 feed materials, our very high protein uh, feed materials. So that's one option. Um, the second option is the sort of is the sort of feeding systems uh, way of looking at things and the sort of development of, of synthetic amino acids, uh, which allows us to supply those amino acids with, without having to sort of supply the crude protein, as it were, that comes from using uh, soya. And then, if you like, there's the alternative and novel proteins, uh, which which attract more of the headlines, I suppose, and more of the media uh, coverage and the sort of constant uh, uh, interest in some of these more novel um, uh, feed materials. So let's just have a, a look at uh, those in, in some detail. So when we look at European um, grown uh, alternatives to soya, so legumes, I mean, we, we grow legumes, obviously, uh, in, in the UK and in Europe, you know, everybody's very familiar with, with, with sort of peas and beans, uh, exa ex uh, for example, that we would grow, you know, all over uh, Europe. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're interesting, of course, uh, they're interesting, but they're, as I mentioned earlier on, that they're, they're not as efficient in the yield of protein that we get from every sort of hectare of land, as it were, than you get uh, in Brazil. So, you know, if you look at the bar chart on the, on the right hand side, which is sort of crude protein per hectare per year, you know, the, the, the Brazilian soy on the, on the sort of left hand side, you know, wins uh, you know, hands down um, uh, compared to peas or beans or lupins and soya beans grown, you know, in Europe. And there is interest. Uh, there are soya beans uh, grown in, in parts of Europe, but the protein percentage and the yield is much less uh, than the soy that, that is grown in Brazil. So in, in a way, uh, you know, you have this, you have this sort of dilemma, uh, which is, you know, why would we uh, yeah, the question is, why would we switch land uh, in Europe, which is very good at growing cereals, for example, uh, and why would we convert that land to start growing you know, legumes uh, and you know, soya beans, uh, where actually it's much less efficient to do that than it is to grow them in Brazil? So I suppose you know, our, our, our starting point is you know, that we should grow crops uh, where it is most efficient to do so. Now, the, the, the converse argument is that obviously technology uh, and you know seed you know seed varieties um, uh, you know will will come along and, and actually you know if there's enough focus put on it then maybe we can develop you know varieties and ways of growing these crops which would include which would increase uh, you know the yield and the protein uh, percentage and also make them easy for people to grow. I mean, the problem with some of these crops is, yeah, they're not that easy to, to harvest. So uh, it's fine for us as feed producers uh, to say, actually, look, we would be we would be seriously interested in, yeah, in buying more peas and beans uh, to, to replace soya. But we've got to we've got to uh, encourage people to grow them. And at the moment, yeah, that isn't that attractive. So so. They're there. They, they're clearly, if you like, the next step uh, up um, from uh, from importing uh, soya. But there are some challenges uh, associated with them. The, the, the second group, I suppose, is is if you like, I would describe this as the day job, really. And this is what we do. I mean, we, we when we're formulating diets, you know, we look at the protein rich, you know, byproducts. They're byproducts as far as we're concerned. So obviously, we're using things like rapeseed meal, sunflower meal, distillers grains. Uh, you know, when, when you're doing them from a sort of a non, uh, you know, non-edible, um, you know, food basis, they're great. They're genuine uh, co-products and byproducts. You know, we like using those, uh, and and they are, you know, they are the, in a way they're our first port of call. But they're limited. Yeah, we we can't just, you know, 
use uh, any any percentage of rapeseed meal or sunflower meal in the diets that we would like. You know, they have anti-nutritional factors. Um, you know, the the digestibility of things like phosphorus, um, you know, is is not so good. You know, they tend to be higher fibre and therefore they limit uh, feed intake. So I suppose our role as nutritionists is, is to is to understand those parameters, understand what those anti-nutritional factors are work out how far we can push them as it were in terms of inclusion rates uh, and then formulate them in and you know there's there's, there's there's ways in which we can process those materials there are things like enzymes that we can use to ensure actually that we can start using more rapeseed meal and sunflower meal uh, than we have done before and i suppose if i look back over you know quite a long time in in the industry you know the inclusion levels of things like rapeseed meal yeah you know, have increased uh, you know, as those sort of varieties have been grown that are more able to be used, the meal is more able to be used in the feed industry uh, than they were um, before. So, you know, uh, uh, an ongoing uh, an ongoing program, I think. Then there's the use of synthetic amino acids. So if, if you remember at the at the start, you know, why why is soybean meal such a great feed material? Because it has a pretty idea, pretty near ideal uh, you know, profile of digestible amino acids. And it provides those limiting amino acids that aren't found in things like cereals. But of course, over the last you know, lot of years now, you know, it, it, what are called synthetic amino acids uh, have developed uh, and, and new ones come on stream all the time. And so from our point of view, you know, every time uh, you know, we, we get the next uh, synthetic amino acids, it provides us with the opportunity to lower the crude protein uh, uh, by 0.5% uh, and therefore the opportunity to lower uh, soybean meal inclusion by 1%, the crude protein of the diet that is by 0.5%. And ag again, you know, if I look back on the long run uh, of diet composition, you know, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were producing diets with much higher levels of crude protein because that was the way we ensured that we supplied the amino acid balance, whereas now we're able to provide a much more, if you like, focused precision uh, approach to providing those amino acids, which doesn't rely on you know, overfeeding crude protein, uh, you know, which is not so good for the animal uh, and not so good uh, for the environment uh, either. So these are the amino acids that we currently uh, are available. So lysine, really the first limiting amino acid. Soya bean is a great, source of lysine but others like methionine threonine tryptophan and valine and, and i suppose from our point of view you know there are more uh, to come and those will all help us to reduce the soybean meal inclusion that we need to provide those uh, amino acids so i suppose if you like though that's the sort of um you know less glamorous uh, uh less media uh, uh attractive um you know day job type of options that we have uh, available as, as, as nutritionists and I guess those will be very you know familiar to, to you but yeah just uh, uh, ju ju just you know one slide on uh, you know on all on alternatives or, or novel proteins I, I, I used to refer to them as novel proteins but but they're not so novel now really so so I, we, we talk to them we talk about we describe them as alternative uh, proteins. Uh, and you'll be familiar, I guess, with some or all of these, but but let's start, I'll mention them briefly. And, you know, the, the one on the left-hand side, so I mean, this is a, yeah, this is a sensitive issue, um, but it's one that we're going to have to um, address and confront. So this is the reappearance of processed uh, animal protein. Uh, and those of you who are tracking what goes on in Brussels and in the EU uh, 27 will be aware that it is uh, almost certain in fact there was a vote in one of the committees this week um, which actually was opposing the, the motion put forward to, to oppose uh, the reintroduction of processed animal protein that was defeated and that, that was sort of seen as the last yeah, hurdle to overcome so so take it for red at the moment that within the EU in any case the use of processed animal protein um, will be reauthorized just to be absolutely clear uh, you know those those of you who can remember uh, you know meat and bone meal this, this is a different material this is from um, animals that are you know that are suitable uh, to enter the, the the food chain so 
that's the first key criteria and of course ruminants are not involved in this whatsoever so completely forget that with one small exception exception which is due to gelatine but don't worry about that for the for the purpose of this discussion so effectively this would allow for example you know processed animal proteins from pigs to be fed to uh, to chickens uh, and uh, poultry processed animal protein to be fed to uh, to pigs so, uh, with a um, with a very strict uh, controls put on us as feed mills to ensure that there is no uh, cross contamination between those two within a feed mill. And a year ago at this point, I would have been trying to explain what a PCR test is, but now uh, everybody's familiar with PCR testing. And if you like the level of accuracy that you get at DNA level from, um, from PCR testing, and that's the level of control that will be required. So you might ask, okay, you've, you've, you've talked about what's happening in the EU, what about the UK? Well, obviously the, the legislation that, that introduced a ban on using animal uh, protein was swept over in the legislation uh, when it came over to Brexit. So the feed ban is still in place uh, in the UK. The Food Standards Agency are tracking um, what's happening in, in the EU. Uh, and so ultimately at some point, it will be a uh, decision for policymakers and for regulators such as the Food Standards Agency to take a view on this, but I can well imagine that they'll want to establish through a consultation or some other mechanism what the what the consensus is, what's consumer view is going to be, you know, what, what what's the view of the retailers, uh, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, if you take the emotional element away, and I'm not saying that you can, but if you look at it purely from a sort of technical evidence-based uh, position, then, you know, processed animal protein is, is the most circular feed material that you can get and would certainly allow us to reduce the amount of soya and imported soya that we use in our diet. So there's a dilemma for all of us, whether we're in the supply chain or we're policy make makers, regulators or civil society. So um, be aware that that one's coming down the tracks. Uh, and linked to that is insect protein. And the link is that at the moment, actually, insect protein cannot be fed uh, to uh, livestock other than uh, fish because of the same uh, um, feed ban and so there will have to be a lifting of the feed ban in some form or other in the UK in order to allow insect protein to be fed and there's huge support for feeding insect protein you'll have seen this all over the place uh, everybody's you know uh, sees it as a you know as, as a future uh, a protein you know one that a circular one the one that's that's not uh, involved in sort of land use change etc and so there's there's a number of sort of pilot projects and studies looking at the use of uh, insect protein and, and just you know in case you're wondering uh you know that that we're that we as feed producers we're looking at you know the, the, what we what you would end up with is the sort of the larvae from from things like black soldier fly which are you know which are processed into a into a you know a high protein meal which we would then feed uh, a feed uh including our uh, in our diets as a, as a high pro so source of high protein. But again, there's a regulatory and there's a feed and food safety uh, issue to be resolved, i.e. what do you feed the insects on? And that has to make sure that that's, you know, that has no feed safety implications. So moving on from uh, to left to right. So algae, um, I think seriously interesting, you know, and I, I think as is sort of cell, single cell protein other than, than algae. And so, you know, this is, this is sort of technology which is developing rapidly. Uh, you know, it has to be uh, scaled up, but, but algae and single cell protein provide all sorts of options. It's not just a sort of protein element, but you can get essential oils and, um, uh, you know, all sorts of other, uh, you know, valuable um, sort of feed ingredients out of algae. They obviously require no land uh, to be grown on. Uh, quite often they can be incorporated into sort of uh, uh, carbon capture mechanisms where effectively you know you 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 tap in you add a biorefinery you know onto a, a a high emitter of co2 and effectively the co2 is almost taken out of the waste stacks and piped through this biorefinery and you produce uh, algal mass which is then dried and then we use it as a as a feed material so you know i, I think um you know very interesting uh, not only from a sort of protein point of view but from a carbon capture um and then on the right hand side we've looked at and are looking at things like plant protein so grass uh, and duckweed and so all i would say is at the moment is 
you know, rest assured that, that Four Farmers is, is investing in all of these uh, projects. We're looking at all of them. We're involved in a number of uh, big projects and small uh, projects. You know, it's cutting edge stuff, but we're, we're there in all cases. Um, I, I think just to be slightly realistic, that these are all options that will emerge uh, over the future, but that for the foreseeable future, you know, we're going to carry on using uh, soya bean meal. And that's why we have to make sure what we do, um, yeah, what we do source uh, is is sourced uh, responsibly. But but there's a, a bit of a look uh, in, into the future. And my, my last slide is one just to sort of leave you with, really. And um, uh, it, it's it's where the discussion is moving onto, which is sort of linking responsible sourcing and carbon footprinting. Yeah, we, we, we now um, uh, are, are starting to, uh, and quite rightly so, get, re get requests from our customers uh, and their customers, so processors and retailers, uh, to, to start looking at the, the carbon footprint of the feed delivered to the farm. Remember, uh, well, it's actually, I say it's over 90%, it is, it's 95% uh, uh, from feed materials. And obviously the carbon footprint of feed is on average, you know, 50% of the carbon footprint of livestock production, a bit less for ruminants, a bit more for pig and poultry. So of course, it's difficult for a livestock producer to reduce their carbon footprint without reducing the carbon footprint of feed. And, and we can now provide that information to you. So, so we, we have the carbon footprint of all of our feed materials. It's incorporated into our formulation system. Uh, and therefore, when we run a formulation for each of our diets, uh, not only do we get the nutritional parameters, uh, but we also get the, uh, the carbon footprint. So that information is available. But when you do start looking at the carbon footprint, then soya comes right to the, 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 the front row. And the, the reason is that because of the way uh, that you calculate the carbon footprint, you show it with and without land use change. And so LUC, you'll hear, start hearing LUC and non-LUC land use change. And land use change, in a way, is the carbon, the GHG charge, uh, if you like, that has to be depreciated over a period of time because that land has been cleared and because of the GHG impact of clearing land to grow crops. And soy from South America carries a very heavy land use change charge. So if you look at the little table, if you look at the right hand side, you've got greenhouse gas emissions uh, without uh, land use change. And you can see, actually, if you take soya from Argentina or Brazil, it's no different or, or slightly better even than, than soya from US. But then when you add, just look at those numbers, when you add uh, greenhouse gas emissions with land use change, you can see that the dramatic effect it has on the CO2 emissions uh, from uh, for soya that comes from Argentina or, or Brazil. So we need to find a way of, of proving no land use change to create a, a level playing field. Uh, and if we go back to the, the, uh, the, 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 the means by which we prove that the soya that we use uh, is sustainably sourced by using certificates, then therein lies the answer. So there are certificates that we're now um, starting to buy, looking to buy, that come through this area mass balance system uh, that we can prove through satellite technology, through verification from audit bodies like Control Union, which can prove that the land uh, on which that soya was grown from which we're buying certificates has not been deforested for at least 20 years. And if we're able to do that, we're then able to, if you like, run our GHG numbers without land use change. And that just makes just such a huge difference. So if that's something that you are uh, you're interested in, then um, you know, please uh, talk to us and we can explain a, a little bit more about um, what we're doing. So um, that's it as far as um, the presentation uh, is uh, concerned. So um, let me, um, we've got one or two uh, questions uh, come in. Please uh, feel free to, um, uh, to ask more. Um, so just while I'm looking at the questions that, that's come in, there's, there's one that I've got already, uh, Sarah, that I, that I wanted to ask you. So you, you, you talked about uh, the way in which we buy certificates. So, so if I'm a customer, um, how do I know that four farmers are buying those certificates on, you know, on my behalf, as it were, as, as a customer? How can, we, how can we prove that to our customers? Okay, so what, what we do is um, obviously we know what feed we've manufactured 
you know, the inclusion of soya in all that feed. So we can put the two together and work out a tonnage of soya that we've used um, over a particular period. Um, and then at group level, we sort of coordinate the soya tonnage that um, we want to cover as certificates. And we'll obviously go and purchase the certificates. Now that process then is audited by KPMG. So they look at how we've sort of pulled all the data together um, from all the deliveries, um, got to a, a tonnage figure and then gone off and purchased those certificates. So it's independently audited. And then those figures then are also quoted on our website and I think in our annual report. So um, again, that they have audited those figures. So it, it just sort of groups it all up, um, but you can break it back down to individual customers if you need to. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, another question come in, which I suppose is is absolutely the right uh, the right the right question to be asked, which is um, okay. You've mentioned these certificates, so so you know who's picking up the bill. You know how how much do they cost, and um, you know how much will it cost the, the the livestock producer or somebody for the fact that we're buying these certificates? Yeah, I mean the the costs are in the whole scheme of things on the cost of a ton of soya are relatively low. Um, and if you look at the variations that you see every day on the soya market, you know, at the moment, particularly, it's so volatile, we can be up five to 10 pounds every day and down. So the cost of the certificate in the whole scheme of things is relatively low that we will cover in, in that cost of that price of the, um, the soya that we're purchasing. Um, but given the tons of soya that we're purchasing as for farmers and as the whole industry, even though the cost is relatively low, it adds up, doesn't it, you know, to a big figure. That really does make a difference out at the source of um, the source of where we're buying it from. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, th there's one that I'm going to um, pick up, uh, which is the sort of controversial one, uh, which, which is um, which is uh, fine. Um, so, uh, do you think meat and bone meal will return to the UK as an alternative? protein well um uh, yeah i mean great yeah great question and obviously um you know we 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 we, we sort of um i i covered it as we as we went through but i think it's a it's a great question to uh to, to ask and i think the answer is um it depends on whether we can whether we can build a consensus amongst consumers and retailers and civil society that actually that you know on an evidence base that this is a, 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 a sensible feed material to use. I mean, you know, we 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 have to take consumers with us, of course, uh, and we have to be able to uh, convince them um, that, that this is a you know a, com a completely safe uh, feed material. Uh, we can show them the sort of CO2 footprint elements. We can show them the degree to which it would mean um, that uh, we can reduce you know our dependency on imported. Uh, feed materials. It, it is, as I said, almost a perfectly circular um, uh, feed material, but it is it is sensitive. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's. I think that, that we, let's wait and see. What I can say is that it will be reauthorised in the EU, and, and I, I, there are member states who, in fact, actually, when it has been voted on at each stage of the. Uh, of the process, actually, uh, it's been it's been voted in favour. You know, most member states have voted in favour, and, and the others have voted against. I think it's probably at the moment the the desire to uh, allow it to be used, and then obviously it's probably up to individual supply chains and um, to be able uh, uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, be, able to be able to accept something like um, yeah, well, like processed animal protein. So uh, I, I think um, yeah, I think. I think a good one to uh, that will that will come down the come down the tracks. Um, are, there's a question about carbon footprinting. Uh, you know, that, are we able to supply the the carbon footprint of all of our diets? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, it's it's built into our the CO2 numbers for each of our feed materials are built into um, the formulation system. So we run the numbers every time we run it. We, we do it anyway. Uh, it's a, it's a parameter that's built into the um, into the formulation system, uh, and therefore every time we we run a diet, we we run a, a CO2 number. Um, at the moment, we're doing that sort of on demand, as it were. So I think the ans my answer is, uh, you know, if uh, if it's something that you're interested in, then talk to us, and we can explain um, 
how we um, yeah how we explain that. Um, there's a great question on uh, the challenge to the, um, uh, the, the dairy sector is get major retailers uh, on side as well. We understand and accept the LUC argument. How do you convince the retailer and ultimately the consumer that the system is robust uh, uh, and um, and not damaging the global uh, environment. Well, I, I suppose by telling our story like like we've tried to do um, this evening, and you know, I suppose you know this is this is our um, this is our sort of uh, um, uh, not first step, but this is the way we want to uh, explain the story, either directly ourselves, but I suppose in a way, you know, to, to directly to you as our customers, and then hopefully, hopefully, then you can uh, be more confident or, or have the information that you need um, to be able to um uh, to talk to your own um you know downstream uh customers um c uh, retailers uh and uh, processors uh, and what i would say is that 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 i i've you know i've been we've been telling you the four farmers story but but so much of this is is also done at industry level so we we do um you know many of us within four farmers you know represent you and us on a number of the sort of industry uh, uh, policy making uh you know there are a number of groups looking at the um you know these due diligence um yeah, requirements uh, and we're there you know and the feed industry is there um you know and your representatives are there so i i, I think yeah we we will uh, yeah and there are routes by which we can we can explain this land use change uh, story and I think I would say yeah you know, we we don't say that this is the, the the ultimate answer but it's a step in the right direction so it's it's work in progress and again yeah we'd be very happy to explain this in uh, in in more detail um, uh, you know if if that's of interest to you or your customers you know rely on us um, to to support you in talking to your your, your customers on 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 this. Um, Sarah, there's there's a good question on uh, on organic because um, actually, I mean, it's quite strange, really, in a way. Because actually, am I right in saying? But correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure there is actually a certification system for organic uh, soya, is there at the moment? But how do we how do we treat organic uh, no. soya? In this, no, it is in a this... good question. I mean, there's a obviously the there's the organic certification scheme, um, but that's not specifically looking at sustainability. I don't believe. Um, I think as far as the book and claim sort of certificates, the tonnage is taken into account because that doesn't relate to source. But with organic, yeah. because it's coming from India, China, completely opposite side of the world to where the rest of the soy is coming from. Yeah, in terms of certificates out in that area, et cetera, I'm not sure we've got anywhere with that at this point. No. Um, but it is an important area that needs to be pursued, definitely. Yeah. No, absolutely. I've always thought it was slightly strange that uh, the org the organic is you know sits outside all you know all the work that we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's that that is absolutely the yeah, the, uh, the the answer. And, and I think I've got one. I've probably got time for one. Uh, yeah, one more question. And I think this is relevant because of the due diligence requirements. And it's uh, and I'm going to be absolutely honest. It's something that we've already been asked, right? Which is if all the risk from soya is in Brazil and uh, Argentina. Why don't we, Sarah? Why don't we just buy it all from the US and just be done with it? Yeah, I mean, uh, we do get asked that on quite a regular basis. But I, I mentioned earlier the the crop season in the US. You know, the harvest is September October time. So at that point, all the US soya is shipped out of out, and probably only till about February, and then Brazil takes over. So that's the season when you can really buy it commercially, and when really it's exported from the US, and then it quietens down. So to say, well, I want that all year round commercially probably is suicidal, but also practically the ships are not coming over from the US. They began coming from Brazil and Argentina with the soya. So practically be quite hard to work out. So, yeah, yeah difficult one at yeah. this point. D yeah, yeah, difficult one. It, it's yeah. it's not so easy. And, and in a way, you know, we, the the <clears throat> that there is, I mean, and certainly, you know, this is a key um, issue for you know for policymakers and 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 the NGOs, right? I mean, they they the, the whole purpose of doing what we're doing in terms of responsibly sourcing and for introducing legislation on due diligence is to make real change happen in those countries that aren't soya not not persuade everybody to stop buying there you know if, if we if we if we stop buying from uh you know from uh from south america then 
you know they can sell their their you know their their soya to China and uh, you know we won't have had the impact that that we all want to have. So you know that's that's a very you know uh, sort of yeah. important point o on which to end. I, I think actually. So look, I, I apologise if if you've asked us a question we've not had chance to answer it. Then I'm sorry about that. Um, but we'll we'll do our best to 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 uh, get back to you. But I'm very conscious of time. You know, we, we've impinged on on your evening. So, um, so thanks very much for for spending an hour with us uh, uh, on an evening. Uh, and I hope you found that uh, useful. Thanks again for your participation. And uh, yeah, enjoy uh, whatever you're planning for the rest of the evening. But for now, um, goodbye, and uh, we'll we'll close the webinar. Thank you very much.